context to some sort of abstraction for analytical purposes. So this is not a criticism of Mike, it's just a different point of view. And that was this, I don't think that ancien regime societies were as unwilling or unable to cope with novelty as he suggested. In fact, the exact opposite. I think if you go back and look at the European societies of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, what is striking is how they were able to develop uh, diplomatic uh, relationships and often alliances with those who might be, um, you might have thought, totally unacceptable. So we can see this in the aftermath of the Reformation, which does not, I mean, Mike presented, as it were, two blocks of incompatibility. Uh, as it were, the meritocracy of the new Napoleon and the French Revolution and the kind of more rigid uh, autocracies. Well, actually, I mean, I'll come to the, whether that's accurate for the Napoleonic period, didn't happen in the 16th century. You have somebody like Henri II of France quite prepared to ally um, with the German Protestants in 1552. You have subsequently uh, French um, willingness, uh, for example, under Richelieu uh, to ally with the, with the Dutch Protestants, Republicans, of course. Uh, you have the willingness to ally with the Turks, and we're not just thinking of the French here. Um, and in fact, confessional divisions, which did have an ideological significance, did not preclude alliance uh, both against across those and also with people often a very different um, political organization. So I don't buy it, don't buy it at all. And what I would argue for the Napoleonic years, and I think this is significant because it affects our understanding of the strategic parameters, is I would be more inclined to take Paul Schrader's view that actually powers were quite willing, if, you know, if coerced, if defeated, but they were quite willing to cooperate uh, with France. Um, but that the problem was that they found that Napoleon was not uh, willing to accept uh, that, and that in a way there was a bellicosity that was in, inherent in his personality and his regime uh, that made such arrangements very difficult. Now we can debate that and you can take different points of view. And as you know, um, there are differences of opinion on this, but I simply wanted to state that because I think it's an important background to any consideration of the strategy under Napoleon, which is the, the sense that if you argue that it is impossible to reach an arrangement, an agreement across this ideological divide, then you assume a different set of strategic parameters to if you argue that it is in fact possible to reach agreements, either one, they don't, people don't have to love each other, but they have to be able to get on with each other. And I, I, my view is very different to Mike's on this. Now, the, the topic I gave myself, and Alex very kindly agreed to let me speak on, was on Napoleon in the context of 18th century generalship. I, I hope, you know, hope not to drop off my peg, and I hope at some stage in the future to be asked to speak on a sequel, which I would like to be able to offer, which is Napoleon in the context of 19th century generalship. But let me look at the context of 18th century generalship. And what I want to do is to talk about the two Napoleons. I mean, the obviously people tend to present him as a continuation or they discuss, for example, maybe what happens after 1809 when the Austrians get better at it. Well, actually there, the, the fundamental divide is this. It is Napoleon in the 1790s when he is not head of state, when he does not control the disposal of French military resources and Napoleon once he becomes head of state. The strategic and operational parameters are totally different. And I think one should, you know, should be aware of that. But anyway, what I want to do is to first of all talk a bit about uh, French generalship under the Ancien Regime and the context of Napoleon 
uh, that that offers. And then I want to try and broaden it out and look more generally at the case. And uh, in doing so, again, I'm offering a caveat. Caveats are important. They're not designed to protect myself. I don't care about protecting myself. They are designed to enable us to help all of us, including me, by taking part in a debate, because the whole point of caveats is they're designed to get people to think about the parameters within which events occur. And one of the obvious analytical uh, caveats is a simple one. These are what are known as diachronic comparisons. I hope that doesn't horrify a word. What it means is comparing things which occur at different stages in time, because obviously at different stages in time, there are differing constraints, differing opportunities, um, both generally in terms of technology and so on, and specific to the political and military circumstances of, of that particular moment. So in doing that, I'm well aware that just about every comparison I offer, somebody there, a very distinguished group of people taking part in this, um, could offer something else. But what I want to start off by doing is saying that the general model which is often offered, which is that the armies of the French Revolution and French Revolutionary Warfare, the two are not quite synonymous, but let's just put that, are, are ipso facto better than French ancien regime warfare is something that I think is problematic or at least a bigger question mark should be put against it. And I think this is important because it affects how one should consider both Napoleon of the 1790s and the different Napoleon of the 1800s. And indeed, one might say, the role of Napoleon in present day French military memorialization. Because one of the things that strikes me is that there is so much of a focus on uh, Napoleon, which, you know, an interesting man, no doubt, um, that what it does often do is lead to downplaying the role, not just of the distinguished groups of generals that surrounded Napoleon, uh, and I'm not just thinking about uh, Massenet, uh, but, uh, or, or Ney, or Juno, you know, or whatever you want, people who stayed on board. I'm also thinking about somebody like Moro, for example, those that are lost along the way are equally often as interesting. Same thing with the American Revolution. Um, you could argue that the best general of the American Revolution was Charles Lee, um, and that actually it was a bit of a blunder in 1778 to lose him. Um, Benedict Arnold wasn't a bad general either, though not as good as Lee. Um, but, and you know, if you compare those with somebody like Horatio Gates, you might think, hmm, the revolutionaries didn't end up with all, way, or Benjamin Lincoln didn't end up with necessarily the best team that they could have played. But let's stick to France for the matter. But the point is generally the case. Now, how on earth can I argue, you might say, that the um, Ancien Regime French army was pretty good? After all, you know, often suggested, um, including by um, both contemporaries and also by historians, that if France had won at Hosbach in uh, uh, you know, the beginning of the Seven Years' War, then the um, you know the revolution wouldn't have occurred, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know that kind of uh, uh, thesis. Always a bit of a problematic one, that kind of thesis. But nevertheless, that's a kind of thesis that has emerged. The argument that the French state lost prestige, that the military weren't all that particularly good, and that this was important. Well, I'm not convinced of that. I'm not convinced of that at all. I'm not convinced also of the of the failure to note the potential of French generalship earlier. So let me start with one of my favorite wars, largely because it's a war which has been underplayed by military historians of the 18th century. And that's the war of the Polish succession from 1733 to 1735. The initial French campaign in Italy was a triumphant success. Key general being a Villa, of course, a veteran of Louis XIV and a member of the council, um, who operating late in the war, um, you know, November 1733, um, advances. Now, he doesn't have to fight the Sardinians because Charles Emmanuel III is on his side, but he advances into the Milanese and conquers the whole lot pretty quickly um, and then goes into winter quarters essentially in February. It is a impressive uh, by any standards. It certainly impressed uh, contemporaries, uh, 
Um, and in 1734, of course, the and in 1735, the other two campaigning seasons of the war, the French similarly are successful in uh, northern Italy. In 1734, the Austrians make an enormous effort at a counter-offensive, and the French beat them in two major battles. 1735, it moves on to a French major siege of Mantua. So in other words, we're talking about the same kind of background activity as you see uh, with Napoleon in the 1790s, 96, 97. And I think you'd be hard pressed to say that Napoleon is doing better. I don't mean by that to criticize him, but I mean to say that I'm not convinced that we should use this is a parameter for saying that the French armies of the 1790s were so much different in their terms of what they could achieve. Or go up to the next war. The next war is the uh, War of the Austrian Succession, um, and uh, which is a war that as far as the French begin uh, are concerned begins in 1741. Obviously, Frederick the Great of Prussia has invaded Silesia of the previous December, but as far as the French are concerned, they begin it in the summer of 1741. Now, in the summer of 1741, the French advance they advance on Vienna as far as St. Poulton, and then they move north and instead go for Prague. Um, this again is not exactly unimpressive. Um, it's a, um, you know, it's a Marshal Belle-Isle, it's a, a considerable advance, logistically well supported into uh, the autumn months and into the early winter, and putting an enormous pressure on the Austrians um, and, you know, a great French achievement. Uh, another French army, incidentally, crosses the Lower Rhine, advances on Hanover, and George II of, of Britain, uh, first George II of, of Hanover, is forced by this into a, a neutrality convention. In other words, to agree that he won't support uh, Maria Theresa and agree not to vote for the Habsburg candidate for the um, imperial crown. Again, a French army achieving success. If we play through in that war, as you probably are aware, it gets harder for the French um, in 1743. The British come in and start fighting, send a major army in. The um, Austrians do well against the Bavarians. The 43 campaign is not a brilliant success for the French. They lose at Dettingen. But in the, the, uh, the Allies then try and put pressure on the French. That is unsuccessful. And then after, under what I think is probably the greatest French general of the 18th century, Marshal Saxe, the French deliver blow after blow after blow on the British, the Dutch, and um, the Austrians. And uh, Saxe, of course, uh, demonstrates his, his ability not just to win very large scale battles, we're talking about battles um, that are much greater in scale than the battles of the 1790s, not only such as uh, Fontenoy, Roqua, La Felt, but also to capture very significant fortified positions, uh, Bergen of Zoom in 47, Maastricht in 48, and to force the Allies to a, to a piece. I mean, it is a tremendous achievement. And Marshal Sachs was much applauded, uh, deservedly. And I think it's fair to say that had he not died in 1750, allegedly as a result of entertaining four actresses at once, which you can take a view on what they meant by actresses. He has a this very impressive tomb of him, by the way, in Strasbourg, in which the devil is reaching out, um, you know, because he's dead and to claim his body, but he himself, his spirit will live on. So re really quite marvellous tomb. Um, um, but if, you know, you could argue, if you wanted to play hypotheses, that uh, a man in like Sachs, who's still quite relatively young, in command at Rosbach, would not have lost. I don't know. You, you may or may not want to play that one. But if you go into the um, Seven Years' War, or what the Americans call the French and uh, Indian War, um, as you will know, Rosbach is a disaster. 
but the French army at uh, advancing into Hanover smashes Cumberland at Hastenbeck, forces Hanover and, you know, into neutrality, um, causes an amazing political crisis in Britain. And in North America, although the French eventually lose, um, they achieve really what is something that is very significant. I mean, France has fewer troops available than the uh, troops that Britain and the British colonies deploy. Uh, under Montcalm, the French gain the initiative um, in, in and use the initiative in 54, 55, 56, in 57, as far as the capture of Fort William Henry. And thereafter, they lose, but they still manage to put up a formidable defence and they use up the majority of the spare British forces until the summer of 1760, which means until the end of the 1760 campaigning season. And as you will know, in an 18th century war, and indeed a modern war, a key element is just to keep going if you have fewer forces in a particular area in order to drain your opponents and limit their um, capabilities to act elsewhere. And that, again, was a very significant um, French uh, achievement um, and one that shouldn't be underrated. Again, and uh, by, by the way, this is these are not exhaustive points. We can, you know, move on. We can discuss these. We can talk about other aspects of these wars. Again, if you were to look at the War of American Independence, which of course American Revolutionary War, whichever term you wish to use, the French don't go in till 1778. Uh, they send expeditionary forces to North America, to the uh, West Indies and to India. Smaller forces uh, attack elsewhere. For example, a French force uh, defeats the British in Minorca in 1782, just as a French force had done the same in 1756. Important achievements. That's a very well fortified British position. Um, the French fight quite well in the French, um, in the um, sorry, in the War of American Independence. They have successes in the West Indies, for example, at St. Lucia. Um, they obviously have successes in, the, uh, in North America, playing a major role in contributing to the outcome at Yorktown. It's not just that the French fleet is off the Chesapeake, it's the French army or uh, expeditionary force is playing a major role in the siege and operations at Yorktown. And the French under Bussy do not badly in in India, just as in the previous war, although Lally was eventually defeated out at Pondicherry um, in 1761, again, the British resources had been used up for a while. So the French and, uh, sorry, the, the War of American Independence, again, shows the French army doing pretty well at operations that are considerably harder than those which Napoleon faced, because it's quite important that one realizes this, that operating across the other side of the ocean, operating in very, very, very different, I mean, Napoleon goes to Egypt, but in comparison to the yellow fever of the West Indies, in comparison to the um, humidity of the Chesapeake, um, in comparison to even more India in the early 1780s and early 1760s, those are much more formidable ecological challenges. In fact, a lot of Boos's force uh, fall ill as a way, as a result. These are much more formidable uh, ecological challenges. And on top of that, they pose much more serious logistics logistical problems and much more serious problems in terms of the cooperation between land and sea forces. And it's always struck me that if you're looking at 18th century military systems, um, the, uh, the prime European ones have five real types of conflict that they have to engage with. Conflict against rebels, or competitors for power within their own state, that's number one. Conflict with, uh, symmetrical conflict with opponents who are similar to those um, in, uh, in Europe. Um, uh, conflict with um, symmetrical, with, with other European powers outside Europe. Conflict with non-European powers. 
and naval conflict. It seems to me those are the five categories. They're not of equal importance and they vary for each state, um, but it's no accident in my, to my, in my mind that the military figures that are least capable are those that in many senses focus or are able to focus only on one type of conflict and don't have a full spectrum range because it's the full spectrum range that often gets you the ability to learn techniques from one area to another. So on that basis, I would argue that Frederick the Great, who only spent his time fighting other regular forces, is a less great general than Wellington, who was obviously in command in India, as well as being in command uh, in Europe, and is able to take techniques from one and implement them in another. And as we know, there has been much discussion in the literature in the past about the transference of technique as a form of enhanced effectiveness in the late 18th century, and indeed more generally. So for example, there are works out there arguing that the Russians and Austrians during their conflicts with the Turks learnt techniques and developed techniques which were to serve them well on other battlefields within Europe. Uh, within, as it were, the symmetrical part of Europe, not the part of Europe they're fighting the Turks. It's been argued that there was a learning experience from conflict in North America. Well, clearly that learning experience is not offered to the same parameters if you're not going to campaign at a great range. So I would suggest that one of the factors that's instructive about the French uh, military um, in the 18th century is that they are ranging widely in the 1740s, 1750s, 1770s, 1780s, and that that's interesting. Now, if you go forward from the end of the um, uh, War of American Independence, the next should be war, as it were. Well, you can take the view um, France and Austria came close to um, conflict, of course, over the Scheldt and the Bavarian exchange in 84, 85. But France came much closer to conflict in 87 with Prussia in the Dutch crisis. And um, it's by no means clear what would have happened. But the reason that the French backed down was not a lack of confidence in their army, certainly not. Um, and indeed, the French were prepared to move north from Givet along the Meuse corridor um, into Holland. And of course, the Dutch patriots were there, were willing to, you know, to ally with them. They were urging them to intervene. And again, one of the ways in which I thought the lecture yesterday didn't really capture the extent to which there isn't this uh, rigid ideological divide at all. Uh, France, after all, in that crisis, finds itself not on the side of the uh, Stadtholder, not on the side of the sort of counter-revolutionary force, if you wish to use that term, but instead allied to the revolutionary force, if you wish to use that term, uh, you know. Uh, what's his name, Simon Chalmers book, Patriots and Liberators, or Alfred Cobben, um, uh, both good books on, although very different books, I ought to add, on that crisis. So the French do not um, uh, uh, attack because of any concerns about their army. Uh, they attack essentially because the lack of uh, political cohesion at that point uh, with the government. The government is, I think it's fair to say, struggling, just as, of course, the same factor is to pertain in 1790 um, with the Nuka Sound crisis. Um, so what one has to uh, think about is at the same time that you have intellectuals uh, military intellectuals uh, pressing for innovation, nothing wrong with that. And like all people in that period uh, and in every period saying that what comes before us is weak and feeble and all the rest of it and that we offer progress, which is par for the course, that's normal. You've often got to think about this with a slight degree of a uh, pinch of salt. Um, Ancien regime societies were not conservative monoliths. They had an ability to both conduct debate within themselves and to innovate. And in that respect, were not necessarily different to revolutionary societies. 
if anything, revolutionary societies tended to be both more and less open-minded, more open-minded because they enable people whom otherwise would not have risen up the hierarchy to have their views expressed or for them themselves to take command decisions. And that's clearly the case with France in the 1790s, but more rigid because obviously uh, people are squeezed out if their politics is unacceptable to the new revolutionary regime. And you might well argue that the major failing of the French Navy in the 1790s was not uh, that it wasn't per se as good in possibility as the British. That wasn't the major problem. The major problem is that many of the best French naval officers, both at the rank of captain and at the rank of uh, admiral, and indeed junior officers as well, who would have made captain, have had to go into exile. There's a greater rate of people in the Navy go into exile than the army, of course, and that the Navy, as a result, is seriously encumbered and its fighting capability is limited because you can have warships. But if you put every ship is different, it's like a piece of artillery uh, at a very different scale, of course, piece of artillery, as you will know, at the tactical level, every piece of artillery in the 18th century uh, isn't what we would call true. In other words, the calibrations because of the production techniques are very different. So one of the major things that artillery officers have to do is learn their guns you know, learn the slight deviations that will occur, that sort of thing. Um, it's called registering your gun, technically, um, and they have to learn to do that. Now, it's even more the case with a warship. Every warship has to be worked up. All warships are different. You have to know how your ship is going to operate if it turns into particular winds, how it's, you know, how it how good its mast is at bearing uh, sails of a certain size, etc, cetera, etc, cetera. you know, the capacity of its cannon. And it's, which is why it's no accident that navies, including, you know, the British Navy is generally regarded as the best in the 18th century. The British Navy often did badly in its initial campaigns because it often had to get itself used again to these warships. Because remember, a lot of the warships have been laid up between wars so that you get, for example, the British Navy not doing terribly well in 1756 you know, being off Minorca, not doing terribly well in 1778 at Ushant, um, not doing terribly well in 1744 at Toulon, and then smashing through later, 1747 at the battles of Cape Finisterre, 1759 at Lagos and Quiberon Bay, um, uh, 1782 at the Saints. So you've often got this kind of learning curve. Well, let me tell you, this learning curve is a hell of a lot harder if you've got rid of a lot of your naval officers already. And you could argue that the revolution and the nature of what comes from a revolution uh, played an enormous role in weakening France militarily, that France was better placed um, in the previous war for having army-navy cooperation um, and using that successfully in a number of features, I've mentioned Minorca, North America, uh, West Indies, getting troops to India, um, et cetera, et cetera. Souffron in Indian waters was very good and very good at uh, cooperating with French forces there. And also then making the fit with their allies, Spain and the Dutch, work better in the American War of Independence than the fit worked in the French Revolution in Napoleonic War. And I think that that is part and parcel of the problem that the revolution posed for the French Navy. And Cormac, I think, is the best book I would say on that. And I would argue that when he becomes ruler, uh, Napoleon just doesn't, can't really manage it, doesn't really manage it. Uh, and that's one of his major drawbacks. But you already see that drawback in the 1790s. He doesn't work well um, with the Navy in 98. Um, he doesn't really understand its vulnerability. Um, and 
um, it's a, uh, to put it mildly, um, given the number of warships that were sank, uh, sunk at Abu Kir, which was much more significant in a way than the loss of the army, um, which eventually came back. Um, given that uh, loss, you might argue that the strategic ignorance of taking a large force into the Eastern Mediterranean, where you were possibly going to lose the entire fleet and the two battleships, line of ship, war, line of ship battle, sorry, I'm tired. Uh, I've done three podcasts this afternoon on totally different topics. I was talking not so long ago on the last latest strategic review and just before that on Churchill. Um, so the, the, the two, the two um, uh, major ships that survived at Abu Ghraib Bay are subsequently destroyed again in the Mediterranean. So it, this is a disaster. I mean, it is a serious disaster. And it has to be said, it's one of the most serious of Napoleon's disasters in the 1790s, and one of the ones of longest term consequence, because obviously when you lose the warships, you lose the cannon, a very significant number of cannon, more cannon in the fleet sunk Abukir Bay than Napoleon had on land, very serious loss. You, leave, you lose your uh, sailors who are difficult to train and who France only has so many sailors and they've been losing them already in a series of battles and you lose uh, some of the few skilled naval officers you have. So it's strategically a disaster. It's operationally a disaster because it, stra it strands, um, strands his army there. Um, and the whole thing is a mess. And it really should be put in part against Napoleon. And I'm surprised it isn't, because as I've said, that's the major aspect, just as you would argue that after all, the loss of the fleet at Trafalgar, and there, now the fleet isn't lost at, as completely at Trafalgar as at Abukir Bay, but the number of ships that go is highly significant. And as you know, it's a Franco-Spanish, uh, fleet. It's the last major cooperation of the Franco-Spanish alliance and bluntly it helps to kill that alliance and bluntly that is a strategic disaster and bluntly it was unnecessary. Um, and uh, knowing that the British had a significant blockading capacity, uh, Napoleon's instruction that the fleet should sail uh, to Italy to try and uh, take part in the Naples operation, where of course it wasn't necessary. Um, that, uh, that instruction was foolish in the extreme. Now, I'm not trying to uh, labor these points excessively, but what I'm trying to argue is that you can go and see uh, French commanders earlier in the century who were better at understanding the exigencies of army-navy cooperation, just as you know, the good British commanders could do the same, and those British commanders, either naval or army who couldn't, let's think of um, the expedition against Carthagena in Colombia in 1741, which is a disaster, largely because of very poor army naval cooperation. The Wiltshiren expedition in 1809, that also is hit badly, though there are other factors as well, of course, as we know, um, by poor army naval cooperation. Whereas when you get the cooperation against, say, Denmark in 1807, um, it works and things, things operate. Anyway, I've, what I'm trying to suggest in this um, section, this half of the talk, is that if you are thinking of Napoleon against the context of earlier French generalship, you should not necessarily see him as better. Now, I know that's a, a diachronic comparison. I know it's a comparison that's going to shock a lot of people, which is good, that's my aim. Um, but I think it is one that is worth thinking about. Now, well, let's just think about in the broader terms of 18th century generalship as a whole. And then I think, I hope there'll be some questions, or if there isn't, fine, I've got a scotch and soda here, and that's, that's not a problem for me. Uh, always drink your alcohol in what looks like a water glass. I once learned that. I was on a British radio programme late at night. It was one of these discussion shows. And I was interested to note that the water in the carafe was neat gin, and that was designed to get the audience, sorry, the speakers to row with each other. Anyway, back to the 18th century. Now, it's always struck me 
looking at the comparison I gave you earlier about the distinction between generals who were heads of state and generals who weren't, that if you're looking at generals who are heads of state, you have both strategic possibilities and strategic problems. And these are well known in terms of the discussion of Napoleon in the uh, 1800s, that he uh, was able to focus the resources of the French state on the major army he was in command of, uh, generally successfully uh, so, um, but that there was the problem then of working out how best to deal with uh, operations in ancillary spheres. And that what that therefore meant is that the best form of conflict for Napoleon was sequential war making rather than simultaneous war making. I ought to tell you that is generally the case. You don't have to be Napoleon for that to happen. That is generally a given of warfare. If you look at Suleiman the Magnificent, say between 1520 and uh, 1566 or his father Selim the Grim, both of those, you know, the most distinguished generals, the most successful generals of the 16th century, go in uh, for sequential generalship. You know, this year it's the turn to biff the Persians, next year it's the turn to biff the Habsburgs, that sort of thing. Um, so that as it were, there is one major field army and that major field army has to as it were, achieve a success in that campaign, if you wish it then to be able to switch to another front for the next year. Okay, so it's not a new thing. I mean, most things with Napoleon aren't new. In many sense, this is not a criticism. In war, very rarely do you get military revolutions. Military revolutions are dreamt up by academics sitting in the bath. They're not a reality on the ground because it's generally the commonality, sorry, the tub, not the bath for you. Uh, it's generally the commonalities of tactics and operational and strategic factors that one notes. But the point I would bring out here is that if you look at Napoleon, not thinking into the 19th century, but looking backwards, he's operating very similarly to that system, which is the normal system. It's the, absolutely the norm. Um, if you take probably the two greatest generals of the 18th century, Nadir Shah of Persia, whose forces, uh, you know, he captured Delhi in um, 1739. Um, he smashes the Ottomans in the 1740s. He campaigns to Bukhara, Can, you know. I mean, he was a great general. Uh, but again, um, you know, very much more so than his contemporary Frederick the Great. Uh, but again, it was sequential warfare that he's doing. Uh, the other great um, general of the um, of the 18th century, long 18th century, because his major victories was in, were in the 1690s. Um, is the Kangxi uh, emperor in China, um, in marvelous victories against the Zungars and conquering um, Mongolia. Um, same thing, uh, the emperor, uh, against the advice of some of his, uh, you know, advisors, counselors who'd warned him about the danger of going out into the steppe. After all, uh, Chinese emperor had been um, forced to surrender in 1450 by the Mongols in similar circumstances. Um, the, um, these are what generals who are operating in fundamentally the same way that Napoleon is operating in. And it's a form of operation which works well of that type of military system. It works well if you are able to fight essentially on contiguous land frontiers, you are not dependent on amphibious operations and the problems posed by land sea coordination. And indeed, in particular, the idea that the leading military figure and the leading army might be on the other side of a body of water, which you cannot necessarily control. Um, think of the problems which Charles V, the emperor encountered when he attacked or attempted to attack Algiers in 1541, for example. Uh, which was not clever. I mean, he'd done it at Tunis in 1535, so he thought it must be okay. Didn't. You should, learning from experience includes learning that experience doesn't tell you necessarily what is going to happen. So, if you're looking at the 18th century from this perspective, then Napoleon emerges 
as similar to a number of military figures earlier in the century who had been able successfully operationally to use sequential uh, campaigning, but had not always succeeded strategically, because one of the difficulties is that in a single campaign sequence, it can, or even a double campaign, two-year sequence, it can be actually quite difficult to knock out your opponent. I mean, if you see, for example, the Great Northern War between Russia and Sweden from 1700 to 1721, and in the case of those two, it's Peter the Great, and then for Sweden until he's shot dead in 1718, it's Charles the Twelfth. There had been significant military um, achievements. Narva is a significant achievement in 1700, Poltava in 1709, and those are only the biggest named uh, battles. But that does not mean that you are able to necessarily force your opponent to accept your will. And here we switch back to where we were talking about yesterday, because Strategy is ultimately about getting your opponent to accept and observe your will. Um, you, you know, killing people will only take you so far. I mean, you know, unless you're going to go in for genocide, you in the end have to reach some sort of solution in which the other side surrender to you and agree to abide by that surrender. Now, one of the difficulties is, in my mind, that the French, to a degree, had lost that skill in the 1790s. In other words, the, um, the skill is of persuading your opponents, once they are defeated, to sit down and shut up. Um, I think it's very, very instructive that Napoleon himself encounters uprisings, rebellions, disaffection in Italy, um, and of course, as soon as France is weakened uh, in Italy, uh, its system collapses in 1799 there. Um, I think it's interesting that in 1796, uh, there are rebellions, uh, upsets, uh, disturbances from the local population in both Schwabia and Franconia. Um, and that indeed the Austrian system, the imperial system, does not collapse in the 1790s. Prussia, it is true, negotiates peace with, uh, with uh, France so that it can focus on Poland. But what is interesting is that the imperial circles go on producing troops. And again, I think it's worth bearing in mind that um, the British government goes on fighting and wins the 1797 uh, general election quite comfortably um, and you know, is relatively domestically stable. So that there is this disjuncture between the uh, operational skill, which definitely exists. There are good French generals in the 1790s, no two ways about it. And Napoleon is one of the best, no two ways about it. But there's this disjuncture between this operational skill and this strategic weakness. And I think that that strategic weakness is greater because, as I said, I disagree. I mean, he's a great scholar, and I do urge you to read the two volumes of the Napoleon so far out, and I'm sure the next one will be fantastic as well. But I don't agree about this idea of these ideological divides. I mean, maybe it's because I'm very interested in naval history. And what strikes me is how France starts off doing well by being able to get Spain and the Dutch to line up with them, not particularly willingly so, but to line up with them, having been bashed up, and to cooperate, and that then that falls to pieces. And France, which should have, with the aid of its allies, it should have been able to settle the world question insofar as the Atlantic is concerned. It should have been possible for a France which also ran the Spanish Navy and the Dutch Navy and commanded, you know, once the Portuguese wandered off, um, commanded, um, you know, Europe right up, if you include the ally with Denmark, right up to include Norway. France in that position should have done better, and it underplayed its hand. I would also argue 
that France underplays its hand in the 1790s. Now that is the last counterintuitive point. And I would argue that the demonstration of it underplaying its hand is the willingness of the Russians by the end of the decade to deploy troops in Holland, to deploy troops in Switzerland. Uh, if you think about it, it had been the Russian, uh, well, as I'm sure you're all aware, it had been the Russian movement of troops into Germany in 1735 and then again in 1748, which had played very significant roles uh, in persuading France at the end of both, well, to end both the war of the Polish succession and to end the war of the Austrian succession because they didn't want to fight the Russians. Um, the French had fought Russians outside Gdansk in 1734 and it had been a disaster for the French. Um, the um, French again um, were, you know, they were co-guarantors with the Russians at the Treaty of Setchen um, in 1779 at the end of the War of the Bavarian Succession, but crucially they wanted to keep Russia out of Western and Central Europe. And I think it's a measure of the broader strategic failure of France in the 1790s that you have Russian troops there. Now, the serendipity of life, of course, is that the Tsar, um, who, is itself, who himself is eccentric, to put it mildly, is overthrown, uh, just as uh, Peter III had been overthrown in 1762. The Tsar is overthrown, and that leads to a change in Russian policy but it should also have warned the French that if the Russians were able to deploy so far west, it should have warned them that they needed to be strategically more careful. And I think that that lesson wasn't sufficiently learned. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for a brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, as always, comprehensive uh, with a a lot of details to to ponder and, and to think about. We have quite a few uh, questions, so if you, we will be so generous to answer them. Um, the first question is from uh, Professor John Kuhn of the Naval War College, and uh, he asks, the mature Villars versus the mature Napoleon, is that the comparison that you are drawing or, and a starving revolutionary mob of veterans and conscripts? And what is a still regarded as finest army of Europe? Am I correct in characterizing the points of comparison? Well, what I'm saying is that I think that Villar's ability, I mean, remember, Villar had himself already been a successful defensive general in the Low Countries in the War of the Spanish Succession. What I'm saying is the French invasion of Northern Italy, the Milanese in 1733, shows that you don't need to have the army of revolutionary France in order to be able to deliver an impressive verdict in Northern Italy. That was the simple point I was making. I'm not talking about something in panoptical terms about, you know, every so often, I wrote a book on tanks and every so often people say to me, well, compare, a, I don't know, a Joseph Stalin against a Tiger Mark II. And I said, well, that's ridiculous. I said, it <laughs> on the context and all sorts of things. Um, so I'm just simply saying that what Vilar shows is the, cap the capacity, it was part of a general argument, that what it shows is the capacity of the French military. I mean, if I wanted to take that further, if you think about the War of the Spanish Succession, the British usually present the War of the Spanish Succession as an abysmal French failure, and they talk about Marlborough's victories. Okay, Marlborough's victories are very impressive. But, you know, you switch, for example, to Spain and you look at the fighting in Spain, the French armies in Spain and the French general there, Marshal Beric, uh, are brilliantly successful. Beric then goes on to be successful in 1719 in the next war, the War of the Quadruple Alliance, when he invades uh, Spain, this time against the um, uh, Philip V. I mean, an interesting reversal. If somebody wants to, is looking for an interesting paper, uh, it's to compare the French invasions of Spain in um, 1808 and 1823 with the French 
uh, operations in Spain in the War of the Spanish Succession and the War of the Quadruple Alliance. Because what it shows you if you do those is you start unlocking a lot of the built-in causative analyses that historians have used. Anyway, that's enough on that one. Thank you. Um, I have a um, uh, next question, uh, which uh, it comes from uh, Frederick Schneid, professor of history at High Point University. And again, um, he wants to uh, ask you a broader oh, question. A very distinguished beard on in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've always uh, he, been this dapper character of enormous, you know, so don't allow your standards to slip, Rick, in lockdown. <laughs> Sorry, uh, the, the question is, um, is the issue really that Napoleon was better than earlier generals or that the French Revolutionary Army achieved its first dramatic victories in almost half a century? Well, I think that's a fascinating, uh, a fascinating question. I mean, I think an important question. I mean, uh, I don't think Napoleon was necessarily better or worse. I mean, I, you know, I think he, we build a lot in the case of Napoleon around a, a number of campaigns in which he did very well uh, without always looking at the broader question. I mean, I would say the analogy is with Charles XII of Sweden there, uh, if you're looking at an 18th century analogy. analogy. But it, with Rick's question, I would say actually Yorktown. I mean, the Americans tend to think of Yorktown as an American victory. I would say it's one of the most, that, that the, both the army there and the Navy in the, uh, in the, uh, Virginia Capes, I would say it's probably one of the most important uh, French victories in history. And that's occurring, what, 1780, October 1781. So that's not, and again, you know, if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, Seven Years' War, the headline story is always, because again, the British have written a lot about the but stuff, is always are British victories, you know, uh, or Prussian victories. So it's Minden for the Brits, Rosbach, North America. Actually, you know, the French are doing quite well in some really tough fighting in 1760, 1761, 1762 in Westphalia and the Lower Rhineland. Sometimes they don't do, they don't win, sometimes they do win, which is not all that different as Gunter Rosenberg showed to how the French did in that similar terrain in the 1790s. And again, I think that would be a comparison that would be interesting for somebody to, to think about, uh, but that, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cause trouble, but there are some very interesting questions out there, these, these comparative ones as to why we think something is better than something else. Now, sometimes it is better, and I'm not disagreeing with Rick. I mean, you know, uh, under Napoleon, French troops go further east um, in, in, in Italy than French, well, France hadn't fought in Italy, of course, since uh, the 1740s, but they hadn't done very well in the 1740s there. So I'm not disagreeing uh, with him, but I'm simply saying sometimes we place a ready indicator of success. We give a big tick point. So again, let me, you know, for, for French uh, scholars listening, some of the greatest French successes of the 18th century were defensive successes. Uh, holding Provence against allied invasions in the 1700s and the 1740s, for example, holding the Eastern frontier against the allies in uh, the latter stages of the War of the Spanish Succession um, or uh, in 1744. These are very impressive, but they tend to get underplayed because so often defensive successes are not uh, applauded. And the obvious comparison there is with the 1814. Um, just to be difficult, I just want to throw fat in the fire. <laughs> Next question. Uh, as a follow-up, um, it's, uh, you partly answered uh, uh, Dr. Ciro uh, Paleoletti's uh, question, uh, but he, uh, to, to, to contextualize it maybe a bit more, because he had a question about um, the two Italian campaigns that you touched upon, one in the 1730s, then Napoleon's 1796 campaign. And uh, I think partly you answered it, but to the follow-up, uh, don't you think that at, at least on tactical operational level, Napoleon was better and innovative? Well, I certainly think he was highly impressive. Yes, I think he was very impressive um, in the, um, 
uh, maneuvering in northern Italy. Um, and I think he was very good at gaining the initiative and using it. And I think that is a really impressive feature of his generalship. I wouldn't say it's unique to his generalship, but I think it was impressive, yes. Um, the, um, I mean, the interesting thing is that he's also um, operating with his, looking over his shoulder at what's going on back in Paris. And I think that that is a cause of tension for any commander. And whereas that obviously there's, ancien, there's factionalism in the Ancien Regime, <laughs> we're well aware of that, it's not quite to the same degree. I mean, if you fall foul of somebody, you're not going to lose your head. Um, and actually Louis XIV and Louis XV was quite good at the way they treated their generals. So I think there is a horrible pressure on people to perform in the 1790s. And it's almost to exemplify Voltaire's comment about you know, Admiral Bing's ex execution in 1757. You know, the English shoot their admirals from time to time to encourage the others, which, I mean, in Condeed, the phrase comes, I mean, it's a brilliant phrase. It actually wasn't all that true. They didn't shoot their admirals all that often, but it certainly was the case that it affected people's understanding of the fighting uh, instructions after they'd seen somebody tried and shot uh, in that fashion. So I think there is this pressure on generals in the 1790s to perform, um, and that can have disastrous consequences, um, uh, it, but it certainly encourages attacking. This is a, a question that comes from Ivan Ordones, and it's a question that I've grappled myself with in my research, and I know my colleagues have, have uh, come across. And it, it, it is a question that is very pertinent to you, Jeremy, in, in light of your upcoming book. The question is, did Napoleon have a grand strategy? And if so, what was it? Um, well, he didn't use the term grand strategy. So it's in a sense, something that we would extrapolate upon him. And I think that's always dangerous in a way uh, because we assume therefore that there is an entity which corresponds to what we see strategy as being. If you mean, did he have goals? then yes, of course, he clearly did have goals. And um, for some of the time, he was extremely good at achieving them. And I think his goals were to, uh, some of them as outlined by Mike Brewers yesterday, um, were those of security, strength, um, expansion, um, I think he saw himself as an Enlightenment figure, but did so in, I mean, you know, people use the Enlightenment as a cohesive element. The Enlightenment had very different meanings, um, uh, but I think he's an example of what I would call the late, late environment, Enlightenment, which is a kind of fusion of Enlightenment policies plus romanticism in terms of the self-presentation self of it and presentation of it to others. And I think that that helps to give you some of the, and I don't mean this critically because all of us have these kind of problems. I think that helps to give you some of the incoherence of Napoleon, um, because if you think about it, uh, for ex where this is most under pressure, um, is when he goes to Egypt, because that's when he's confronted most obviously with the, both the burden of history, the physical burden of history, literally, and the, bur the imaginative burden of history. Sorry, we're going to get the clock now. Sorry, can't do anything about this. <laughs> um, can't, can't hold time back. <laughs> um, 
Actually, I live at number seven. My at number one, Michael Joy, who's actually quite a jolly man, has a, a sundial outside his house, which basically carries with it a motto, which says, you know, in the end, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> you just think, well, yeah, I mean, so anyway, so Nepo so at in Egypt, I think you get the juxtaposition very much of this enlightenment, this very late enlightenment, but with the romanticism there. And the problem is that he seeks to resolve so much of this policymaking conundrum through his the position where it's easiest for him to move forward, and that's through the use of force. So ultimately, I think Napoleon's strategy, if you wish to use that term, is not just a matter of goals, it's a matter less willingly, but nevertheless, subconsciously, I'm not sure that that's true, but a matter of the actual means as well. And in that respect, we loop back, oh, I would like to suggest we loop back to what I was saying at the beginning about the bellicosity, but also the creation of a regime and a ruling elite cadre, both for France, the greater France that he has created, and for um, Europe as a whole, um, organized around that principle. Now, Napoleon's not unique about this. There's... Um, and a very good American scholar, uh, Brenda Meehan Waters, years ago wrote a book on Peter the Great's Table of Ranks and how Peter the Great, uh, she didn't use any comparison with Napoleon, I'm bringing that in, but how Peter the Great creates, as it were, a new regularization of the traditional nobility of Russia based on the idea of service to the sovereign. Uh, and in a way, uh, Napoleon, as I've said, Napoleon is a much less radical figure than people often make out. Napoleon is, in many respects, doing a Peter the Great. Um, um, and um, I think that Peter, although he fought much of his life, was better able, possibly because he was, a, you know, he'd you know, come to the throne. I mean, obviously, <laughs> through a coup, uh, but, uh, you know, but he'd come to, he was, he was of the, uh, of the royal blood. Um, Peter is possibly better able to move outside the military logic of his policies than Napoleon is. So I would say that's part of the strategic conundrum, that Napoleon finds it very difficult to move beyond the strategic knowledge, logic of military force, which then means that military force helps to define his strategic logic and goals. Thank you. I think uh, next question is related, I think, to this uh, kind of wider context or in, in grand strategy. And this is a question from uh, 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 Ramiar Kohzadi. And um, the question is about Egyptian campaign and, uh, and, and the grand strategy of it. Was it worth it to lose the Navy? No, in my view, it wasn't. In my view, it wasn't. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you know as well as I do, you've got two distinguished biographers of, of Napoleon speaking. You've got Charles... Uh, you know, you've got Charles Esdale talking about Napoleon, you've got, uh, there's Philip Dwyer's biography, and, you know, there are distinguished French works as well. I mean, you know, there's no shortage of stuff on Napoleon. And as you will know, why he went to uh, Egypt has been much discussed, and there's been the analogies drawn with Julius Caesar and trying to hold on control of the army, etc., etc., etc. So that the logic of it uh, has to be seen in his terms. But the point is that at that stage, he wasn't the head of state. Um, and what he was doing was disastrous in terms of the directory government's pressure, the pressure upon it in the War of the Second Coalition. If somebody had assassinated Napoleon at the end of 1797, he would have fulfilled his tasks for the directory and the next year was really not helpful. So he would have been a good, you know, I mean, Stalin would probably have had him shot 
Um, he would have been, to use a diachronic uh, comparison, uh, he would have been a good person to have removed at that point because he was really not helping France when he went to Egypt. He was helping himself, but not France. Um, the next question is uh, from Cesar Peña Mondragon, and it's a question about uh, what informed French military success in the 18th century, especially wars of Polish succession, Austrian succession, Seven Years' War, in terms of this military thinking, old military thinking, the new emerging military thinking, and specifically he mentioned in this context the works of Guibert, Bousset, and others. Yes, that's a very interesting question. Um, to my mind, and I'm very happy to be criticized for this, Mo there were, as, as, as the gentleman mentioned, um, a lot of um, theoretical writing, and there's been some good work, including by good American scholars on Gibert and so on later in the century. But to my mind, in the first half of the century, people are largely learning on the job. So if you're looking at people like Villar or Sachs, Richelieu, for example, who goes to Menorca in 56 and into Hanover in 57. These people are learning on the job. Beric, who um, is the, you know, Villar commands in um, Italy in the uh, uh, war of the uh, Polish succession, Beric commands in, in Germany, uh, kind of gets into trouble that way. Um, but uh, the, these people have learned on the job, generally fighting under or on the staff of other people. So, um, uh, Sachs under Marlborough, for example. Um, and the French had a long tradition in the 17th century that you, as it were, validated yourself. Obviously, you, you, know, you had to come from the right kind of background to be within the possibility range, but you validated yourself by becoming a protege of somebody like the Grand Condé or Turenne. And uh, Luxembourg, obviously, very much. And then that was your imprimatur. Um, now, the difficulty is you then, and this is something that the French revolutionaries don't have to put up with, you then have the problem that you have armies um, which have royal sprigs attached to them, the Duke of Burgundy during the War of the Spanish Succession in the Low Countries, who are no good. Um, I suppose the nearest equivalent to that in the Napoleonic period is um, uh, is in Spain, where the, <laughs> you put in the king and he's not a brilliant general. Um, but, um, you know, that is a problem with the Anchean regime. And uh, Louis XIV, interestingly enough, um, understood his own limitations. He was more interested in a stage-managed activity. So he goes along to witness sieges and to take their surrender, Namur famously. Uh, Louis XV does that. I'm pretty certain Louis XV's at the siege of Freiburg in 1744. I think the only major battle Louis XV's at is Fontenoy, and he doesn't take command, uh, crucially, uh, which shows that he has common sense. Um, so one of the potential disadvantages of Ancien Regime uh, systems is when the monarch tries to take command. That's become less common. In terms of the formal theory, I would say the area where formal theory is most important is not battlefield activity, it's fortification and siege craft. So I would, and if you look at the, the you know, the many plans of fortresses that are um, reprinted, the reprinting of Vauban's works, the debate, there's a very good American book on the debate between different uh, geometric notions of fortification in the 18th century. I would, and of course, the 18th century is the period with um, developing mathematical knowledge. The person most famous is Euler, of course, but he's not the only one, Benjamin Robbins, for example. Um, so that I think though that kind of knowledge is presented back best in publication form, but I don't think you would find that um, uh, all generals 
uh, would have would have read that. And the way in which fortification is often kept separate helps to mean that you can have this very separate form of literary uh, understanding from that which is, you know, the notion that you have to show bravery and learn on the job that way. Thank you so much. Um, one more question, if you uh, are yep. yep. excellent. Um, the question is uh, from Neil um, Carey, and he states, it is striking to me that Napoleon opened each of his campaigns during this, he says, golden era, but from 1805 to 1812, uh, with marked numerical superiority against him, his immediate enemies. Was his main achievement, therefore, ability to mobilize quickly, moves quickly at a large scale than his predecessors? Well, that's a very good, all of these questions are fascinating. Um, that's a very good question. I mean, um, several things to say. First of all, as we already have discussed, being the head of state does mean you can focus the resources of your state, and in Napoleon's case, your empire, uh, including the forces gained from your allies, on your uh, major field army. And also, of course, for these activities, Napoleon is taking the initiative, uh, as he does in 1805, for example. Um, the um, numbers themselves do not necessarily dictate victory, and numbers themselves face uh, serious logistical constraints. And I wouldn't like to say that Napoleon simply won because of numbers. He was a very skilled understander of how to maneuver at the operational level. And that was very important to his success. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily numbers. I mean, you know, as you know, I'm interested in naval warfare. Um, you don't necessarily win a, well, Trafalgar is the obvious example. <laughs> you know, the smaller fleet won um, and the less heavily gunned fleet won. Um, so I, I, I think one has to be careful, but I think it's part of Napoleon's skill. I mean, given that he is going in for sequential um, fighting, often, not always, against coalitions, he has to dislocate the coalition. And the easiest way to dislocate a coalition is to reduce its numbers. Now, that's not new to Napoleon. I mean, if you look at Louis XIV in, um, in um, 1677, 1678, the last stages of the Dutch War, or 16... Uh, 96, 97, we've got Cairo there, he'll tell you about how, you know, uh, the, the, the French were significantly important in weakening the coalition against them at the end of the War of the League of Augsburg, or 1713. I mean, one of the greatest offensives that France launches in the 18th century, I mean, is against in the Rhineland in 1713. Uh, um, and they're partly able to do, I mean, they've got good generals, again, Vilar is there, um, but one of the reasons they're able to do that is because 1713, you know, the British, the uh, uh, Victor Am 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 Amadeus II, plus the Dutch leave the war, so the French have got the opportunity to thwack both the Austrians and the empire as a whole, which they do. Um, and so the ability to weaken your opponent by dislocating them and then to go on to mount a subsequent blow against the remaining uh, elements in the coalition against you proves very valuable um, in that big campaign in the mid 1800s but it only will take you so far because ultimately he is dependent on Russia agreeing to negotiate and that is a problem. Um, Russia, you know, uh, the, you know, the two battles, um, uh, even if he'd won both of those battles, um, you know, if you think about it, at that point the Russians were also fighting the Turks um, the Russians are, have got an enormous amount of buffer. Um, and I suspect uh, years and years ago, I wrote a book on French foreign policy from Louis XIV to Napoleon. One of the points I made is, you know, okay, the French do very well under Louis XIV, but if you look 
at the buffer that Russia is acquiring in the late 17th century and then right way through the 18th century, that is, a strate that is of strategic consequence far greater than pushing France's frontier back maybe 100 miles, or even, you know, if you were going to push France's, France's frontier back a bit more. So he's lucky in 1807 that the Russians are willing to negotiate with him. Now, the Russians need to because they're also fighting the Turks, but he's still lucky. That's right, not just Turks, uh, Iran, right? The war started with Iran in 1804. Yeah, that's right. 1808, you're going yeah. to have Sweden yeah. as well. That's right. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you know, in a way, well, you know, your book on the worldwide thing, Napoleon um, is engaging in a highly competitive environment. And it's a difficult one to understand. It's made harder as in the relationships with Persia, for example, by the just the time communications take. Um, and there, you know, there is this awful problem that he's buggered up the naval dimension. I mean, if he could only, one of the interesting things is you've got hotheads in Britain, Edmund Burke being the most famous example. You've got hotheads who want to change France ideologically. But actually, the vast majority of the British don't. Um, George III, on whom, as you know, I've written a biography, doesn't like what's happened, but he rapidly comes to the view that it is stupid to go on fighting in order to restore monarchy um, in, uh, in France. And the, there is a, a degree of folly, I think, I mean, you know, we can criticize British, British policy, I'm happy to do that, but there's a degree of folly that the, the French are not looking at ways to try when there are negotiations, when the British government is divided over negotiations with France, 1796, 97, and 1806 are the best examples, as we know there are negotiations which are successful in 1802. But you know, there are other occasions. And to have just done something to have uh, assuaged some of those tensions would have been sensible. Because what you see, if you look at the analogous, analogous situation with the British and, and the United States, is the British in the United States, it had been a horror, it had been a civil war. And you know, civil wars are always much more bitter. See France, 1793, see the Americans in the 1860s. But the civil war, the British had lost it, and they then give up on revanche. There is no attempt at revanche in America for the British. And when, you know, John Adams comes over as the first ambassador and George III says to him, you know, I did everything possible to stop you winning independence, but now that you've won it, you know, I will hold out my hand in friendship and that's it. And, you know, the War of 1812, the British don't want to fight the Americans, it's the Americans who want to fight the British. Um, so I think that the, there was, I think that was unfortunate because I don't think it was necessary to have that degree of conflict between the two powers. And I certainly think it constrains Napoleon's options for thinking on global terms. One last question, and I know it's getting late. Um, and the last question is if we flip the positions and look from the, what we tend to refer to as an allied side, what strategic advantages you see there? Uh, what are the challenges of coalition warfare in, 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 from a strategic point of view then? Yes, uh, in which period are we looking at? 1790s? Well, the, through the 18th that? century, right? Because France and, and, and throughout, throughout the period we see the coalition warfare. Well, you do, you're right. I mean, as ever, um, coalition warfare poses the problems that are both macro and micro. The macro one is different uh, interests between the powers, those interests being not just interests in terms of specific territorial uh, concerns, but also in terms of how much effort they want to put into a particular struggle and over what time span. So those are the macro ones. The micro ones 
is how do you deal with resource differences between the constituent powers? How do you actually arrange cooperation at the operational level? Um, and uh, how do you actually deal with the uh, questions of, you know, the, just the time it takes to move information around a system and to create a coherent uh, set of ideas. I mean, one of the important things in 1815, in the last coalition, is that the Tsar and the Emperor of Austria are already both um, in Vienna. Um, and on top of that, um, you've got Castlereagh for the British, you know, you've got a, a team there who are able to discuss things. Well, <laughs> this is not the normal pattern. Um, <laughs> But so, so I think I think it is there is a great advantage if you're up against a coalition, particularly if you're on interior lines, viz Frederick the Great, or if you're up against a coalition just itself, the Directory by late 1799, as in fact on the eve of Napoleon taking power, uh, or Napoleon and the other his chums taking power, the, the alliance against the Directory is crumbling rapidly in fact, um, and the Directory's ability to just keep going has been one of its most significant factors. Interestingly enough, it falls to the internal pressure, not the, exter not the external pressure. So yeah, running a coalition, extraordinarily difficult. And one of the challenges of the scholarship of the period is to think through what this means. But can I say, it's also a problem for the French. If you look both through the 18th century and in the revolutionary period and in the Napoleonic period, there are the problems for the French of running coalitions. If you look at um, uh, Franco-Spanish uh, relations, um, if you look at Franco-Bavarian relations, now those are, they're not the only alliances, those are two very important alliances for both powers, Bavaria and Spain as well as France, and they offer strengths but they also offer weaknesses, and you can find examples both in the Ancien Regime and during the Revolutionary Napoleonic period when good use is made, and you can find examples when bad use is made, uh, unsuccessful use. Now, ironically, I would put it to you that the um, Bavaria probably was provided, was better understood or more easily intimidated, whatever phrase you want to use, we need to think about this, um, uh, by Napoleon than Spain was. And that, that again raises a whole host of interesting questions and consequences. I mean, you've got Charles Esdale coming to speak. I mean, he's obviously the person to ask about this sort of question on the Spanish side. But I think, again, this sort of comparison, because it's not the case that France is necessarily bad at alliances. Sometimes it's very good, but sometimes it isn't. And it's not necessarily the case that it's because it's the revolutionaries or because it's Napoleon or because it's Louis XIV. I think that there are some dynamics that work better than others. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for this wonderful presentation, for your generosity with the time and answering this question. Oh, really? I mean, can I really sincerely, I mean, I'm very, very sorry that, you know, I'm getting old and, you know, I, I hope I hope to get to America again before I drop off my bed. <laughs> my bed it's, it's important. And, you know, Americans probably don't see this. They are the center of scholarship, free scholarship on on military history is, you know, the center is, is the United States. And uh, there is, you know, the marvelous uh, Society of Military History. There are the the multiplicity of universities where military history is still taken seriously. And there are the large number of, in addition, of private scholars who are taking the subject as well forward. And I think that's marvelous. So it's for us in elsewhere in the world to learn from what the Americans are doing. So many thanks for inviting me. If you do another one of these, I'd be very happy to think through the question of um, Napoleon in the context of 19th century generalship, which I haven't thought about yet, but I think it's actually another interesting way to, to conceive of him, think about I it. I think Dr. Schneid and I will get together and come up with something wonderful that uh, maybe in person uh, soon enough. Oh, <laughs> thank well. you so much. Thank you and best wishes to everybody. <laughs>
Um, just before we leave, uh, I want to remind you that we're going to uh, uh, resume our uh, symposium tomorrow morning. Uh, make, check your emails. I'll send out a new link. You probably noticed we got Zoom trolled, uh, and I'll make sure that the new uh, uh, the new link is not uh, is not as accessible. So please uh, join us tomorrow. Have a good night and stay safe. Cheers.